Good morning, CLC. I invite you to let the love just shine in your heart right now with a nice, deep, cleansing breath. Breathing in cool, calming oxygen. And as you breathe out, breathe out all that no longer serves you. Take another nice, deep, cleansing breath. And as you release the breath, release all stress and tension you may be holding in your body, all anxiety and stress, just let it go for now. Allow your body to just relax in this moment and allow your mind to be here now. Universal love enfolds me. Universal wisdom inspires me. Universal spirit enlightens me. Universal power encircles me. I am one and all is well. As we begin this inner healing process, let me invite you to relax in quiet confidence, opening yourself to the miracle working higher power. Now symbolize the unity of your thinking and feeling nature by touching your chest with your hand and let my words act as your own for your own inner healing acceptance and receptivity. I acknowledge that there is a power, intelligence, and wisdom greater than my own. I am in the midst of it, and it is in the midst of me, sensitive and responsive to my every thought, word, action, and feeling. I now make this true for myself by saying aloud, I acknowledge. Acknowledging this higher power working through my life, I admit that I am personally responsible for solving my own problems while being guided and assisted by something greater than myself. As I am ready to surrender the conflicts of my ego to the wisdom of this infinite presence, I simply speak these words, I surrender. I surrender. Knowing that forgiveness is the key to unconditional love and the feeling of heaven, I now unconditionally forgive anyone and everyone who has ever injured me in any way, real or imagined. And I now forgive myself for all of my mistaken judgments and their resulting actions. From my deepest level of understanding, I now say, I forgive. I forgive. Realizing that I continually experience the effects of my own thinking, I now choose to allow this higher power to recreate me deeply, filling my mind with thoughts that are only positive, constructive, loving, and beautiful. I call upon this divine inflow by stating aloud, I choose. I now center upon that one special idea that I'm willing to accept as real for me in this coming week. 
visualizing that idea as already acted upon and brought to pass, in seeing my idea become a fact of my experience, I enjoy the happiness and peace of my thought fulfilled and gratefully speak these words, I accept. I accept. Knowing that I have an everlasting place in the midst of the power that sustains all creation, as well as the support of all those around me, I allow myself to relax in the peace of fulfillment and gratitude and say, I release. I release. Now, in my mind's eye, I envision the presence of someone near and dear to me. This can be a friend, a family member, a teacher or mentor, someone who has touched my life in deep and loving ways. Someone who may not be physically present in the room with me this morning. I turn toward that image in my mind's eye and say, I'm grateful for the good in your life. Now I open my eyes, turn to the world around me, and joyfully speak to anyone physically present in the room or virtually on this broadcast, and share in confidence and gratitude and saying, I'm grateful for the good in your lives. Serenity, courage, and wisdom from the Serenity Prayer works out really well with today and the rest of this series, which is going to run nine weeks. The last time I did a nine-week series, it didn't go so well. Some of you may recall that was the series on the nine muses. And about week number six, someone who shall remain nameless, came up to me and said, please stop. <laughs> and I said, I can't stop. I got three muses to go. Can't leave everybody hanging. But this is a nine-week series, and it's drawn from some writings. It's drawn from a lot of stuff in my library, and, it, and, and a number of writings that are contained in a book called Courage, Conviction, and Consciousness. And Reverend Lisa is going to begin using that book in April in her morning readings on Facebook. I was introduced to the book at Mile High in Denver. It's a collection of 365 daily readings by women in New Thought. Not 365 women. I think about 175 because some of them get more than one entry, you know. And uh, it's over this about 150-year period uh, that these writings are collected by a Dr. C. William Mercer, who went to the archives there at our home office in Colorado and researched for I don't know how long to pull together this material. You may recall some of you, um, I don't know if it was this year or the end of last year, when I read the piece called Why We Believe by Hazel Holmes, who was the wife of Ernest Holmes, I found that in his book. It was originally published in Science Mind magazine, and later I found it there through the archives. But where it first came to my attention was in that book. That book is winging, winging its way toward us right now. So we will have a stack of them in the bookstore as of next Sunday, and you will have one. Lisa, so you can begin your work. And, uh, yeah, that'd be good. And uh, so I commend it to you, or you can find it, you know, in the usual online vendors. But what I like about it is it's readings. Well, there's a lot of things I like about it, but they're readings from people I'd never heard of, including today's, which is a Reverend Sally Taylor. Most of these women are gone now. I think there are only two out of the collection that I've found who are still who are still with us, Sally Taylor passed in 2015. She was the Unity Minister, the Unity Soul Food Ministry. And she wrote something 
how I did this, this is how my process works. I didn't go through all 365 pages to find what I wanted. I kind of said, spirit, move things along here. Let me, let me just open and point. And that's pretty much what, what I did. A couple of things I went looking for because I knew they were in there, but mostly it was just open and point. And then I put them in order where it seemed sequential. Her writing today is about prayer, about prayer as a state of mind, about prayer as a state of your mind and my mind, and how prayer does not change the mind of God, nor is it intended to do that. And I thought, well, you know, ever since we were in the crib, we've been trying to persuade somebody of something, haven't we? We're in the crib and we, we cry and we, and it's like, come feed me or come change me or come do something, won't you please? And we get a little older and, and we're, we learn deal making and we learn some kind of art of persuasion with the people around us, our family, our teachers, later our employers, our partners, you know, there's this, there's this whole transactional thing that we, we go through. And so it's natural that we would think if we're dealing with God as an amplification of humanness. That is to say, God ballooned up real big to cosmic proportions, that we would use the same strategy of persuasion, only more so, and go to this God and say, look, I realize you haven't heard from me a lot lately, <laughs> but my back's against the wall now, and you are God, and Scripture says you love me, and can you give me a break? Can you give me a break? And furthermore, if you'll give me a break, I'll change. <laughs> I could do a nine-week series. We just did a series on change. I could do a nine-week series on the promise to change. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I swear I'll change. <laughs> I'll go to a faith community every time they're open, and I'll listen and I'll take their classes, and oh, I'll donate money too. <laughs> I haven't up to now, <laughs> but I will. <laughs> it's, I have to say, it's funny sometimes over the years, people have come to me and they've said, you know, if I win the lottery, creative life is going to have new buildings, new wings, new this, new that. And part of me wants to say, could you give us five bucks today? <laughs> well, so we, we go to God a lot of times, I think, in our minds, in certain faith systems, and, and we transact. And uh, we do this on our own behalf. If we do it on the behalf of other people too and this is a fun thing about change that I didn't really get into in uh, last month I don't think all that much is we go to God and we say can you fix this person over here because they're really annoying and I know I know that you God don't want them living this way so I don't know why you haven't done anything about it before now but I'm here to tell you you have my cooperation. <laughs> and if you'll guide me in what I need to do to say to them, I'll handle it for you. Just so long as I know you've got my back. <laughs> These are strategies, just some that are coming to me, of how we have transacted with the deity. There's only one issue with that, as I see it, and that is that's not the God I believe in. I don't think it's the God you believe in either. Again, you wouldn't probably be sitting in this room listening to this talk. Instead, if we look at God, look at the deity. Let's call it the deity because God has, we twitch sometimes when we hear the word God and our eye kind of, you know. But the deity, the one all-encompassing intelligence, the one all-encompassing love that created everything and sustains everything and works through everything, you know must be working through you, must be working through me, is not absent from us. 
does not have to be brought into the picture, does not have to be gone and gotten, you know, like you would a friend. Like, come on, you know, come have, help me out with this, and you, and you bring them in, and you fill them in on the story. You know, here's what's going on, and I need your advice, or I need your support. Instead, this one being ubiquitous, big long word there means everywhere present, <laughs> ubiquitous, within us requires only then that we convince ourselves, that we convince ourselves of our good. And that can be an issue. Because while we think we can bamboozle the distant God and say to it, look, I know I haven't, you haven't heard from me much and all of the rest of this stuff, and we can kind of manage that conversation and sell ourselves to it, we can't sell ourselves to ourselves because we know ourselves too well. You see? When we're guilty, we're good and guilty. When we have regret, we have lots of regret, and we maintain it. We visit it daily, you know, and, and water it and, and uh, fertilize it and, you know, keep it going, this, this regret. We know, we know that it's there. That's why we have to work on the self. That's why we have to begin with the self. Say, I forgive myself the way I am. The first time anybody says to themselves, I forgive myself for being who I am, they don't buy it. But it gets them thinking. And the second time they buy it a little more, and eventually it's like, yeah. And you get angry about it. You think, why have I judged myself this way for all these years? Because I thought I had to because of some orthodoxy or some bad advice, bad information from other people, whatever the reason. You know what? There's still time. We never run out the clock on a good do-over. So eventually, and I would like to think sooner than later, and I would also like to think that the people who are part of this faith system that we have at Creative Life and CSL and New Thought generally are people who are ready to move ahead with this process sooner than later. You know, eventually what happens is we get it that we're, we're all right just the way that we are. And when we get that, the deity has gotten it. And things begin to respond to us by corresponding to that new idea. Life works better. We don't have to struggle so much. We don't have so many misunderstandings. You know, one of the most grinding things in daily life is misunderstanding. Have you had misunderstandings lately where there's people that you'll say the sky is blue? And, and they'll, they'll be like, what do you mean by that? They'll, you know, <laughs> they'll take it wrong or something. Or they say it and you take it wrong. And it's so nice to not only not have that be the case, but to be able to deal in shorthand with each other almost telepathically where we can move the conversation along accordingly and just know and just know that we know and finish each other's sentences in a wholesome kind of way, not in an intrusive way where you steer the conversation somewhere else, but we're just, I guess the word I'm looking for here is wavelength, where we're just sort of on the same wavelength. And if we assume a unity among the human family, that all of us are built to work, all of us are beloved of the deity of the system, you know, of life, then, well, it's easier to focus on what it is we wish to create in our lives instead of all the impediments that we see on the way to doing that. So what she has to say about Reverend Sally Taylor, she says, we pray to change our mind, not the God mind. And, and I, I add to this, also not other people's minds. Because you see, it really doesn't matter what anybody else thinks of you, um, except to the extent that you feel that it does. And if you've hurt somebody else's feelings and you want to have a sustainable relationship with them, then you need to do something about that, don't you? But as far as just the general judgments and opinions that people form about us, that really is their business. So we can offload a lot of that, clear out a lot of, a lot of that material from our minds. We don't have to convince anybody else of our entitlement to good. We also don't have to convince any specific person which is different than 
other people generally, but we don't have to convince any specific person of our entitlement to good, including like the person we work for, okay? Or the person that we may be married to, or the person that this, or the person that has what we want, you know, um, that they're selling or that they're offering or that they're kind of a gatekeeper to. We don't have to convince them. You know why? Because if they don't go along with the program of the intention that we've set, somebody else will. Somebody else will. Which is why in our prayer in, in this science, we often use the expression, this or something better. This or something better. So for example, somebody will say, well, I'd like a job with XYZ Corporation doing this, sitting in that office, making that much money with these responsibilities, that much time off in the year, on and on and on, okay? You, practitioner, you, minister, make it happen. <laughs> you know what? Can't guarantee it. Why can't we guarantee it? Because there are other people's choices involved, right? We can't arm twist you just because you're like part of this. We can't arm twist you into, into a, a situation that is, is going to override the choices of anyone else, overstep the bounds. But what we can promise is this. If you will collect together all of the images of the reality you want to inhabit, it will happen to you. It will happen for you. It will come and find you. I don't know where it's coming from. Not a living soul knows where it's coming from, but it's out there. This or something better, it will show up. Now, what I tend to do and you tend and most people tend to do, you know, is say, I know that's great, but I really want this. <laughs> I understand, but I mean, okay, well, you're entitled to want it, but you may not be entitled to get it. Again, because other people's choices. You ever drive by a house you just love? It. I'd love to live in that house. Guess what? Somebody else lives there. You cannot oust them. You cannot evict them um, morally, ethically, and certainly not legally. <laughs> you know? Now, it may happen, and this is weird, but this works. It may happen that you're sort of psychically picking up on a desire that the people who live there have to move. Because that does happen. It still doesn't mean that, you know, you, it, it doesn't mean anything beyond what it means. And it could happen they have no intention to move, but down the way they, they will. And so it's a matter of patience. But what's most likely to happen statistically across the board is that that house reminds you of the perfect right house that's out there for you, that is making itself available. That not only people are wanting to vacate and all of this, but it doesn't have termites, you know. <laughs> it doesn't have a leaky roof and stuff wrong with it, and it's going to be affordable to you and all the rest of it. Um, that or something better. Of course, nowhere is this more true than in terms of human relationships. Because people will say to those of us who do counseling work as practitioners and ministers, that they'll say, I've met somebody. I'm, this is generic. Nobody's actually said this, but I'm, it's a generic kind of thing, right? I've met somebody, and they're perfect for me. I'm like, good for you. Okay. Here's the thing. They don't know I exist. <laughs> okay. But they're perfect for me. Make it happen. <laughs> no, there's a word for that. <laughs> no, there's several words for that. <laughs> we can't do that. It's overriding other people's choice. But the qualities that you see in this person that are attractive to you are possessed by your perfect right partner who is out there who if you're looking for them, you may be sure they're looking for someone like you. And they may be on the other side of the world right now, but they will make their way to you without knowing what they're doing. 
I don't know how this works. But there is story after story after story, especially um, in terms of discovery and invention and creativity and, and all, and I, I dropped a couple of these into the conversation with you, I think, last week. Stories where there's somebody in, I don't know, Belgium, let's say, who's walking around with a head full of ideas of how things could occur, and they meet somebody who's from, I don't know, Japan, let's say, who happens to be visiting Belgium, who has the the rest of the yin yang, you know, has the rest of the puzzle for them. And how did this happen that these people met? How did it happen? God, I could tell you some stories because I just got through doing a, an 11 hour class over the weekend on New Thought History where a lot of these stories come up. How somebody wanders into a place and overhears a conversation and gets interested in what they hear and what they create changes everything. I don't know how this occurs. But if we'll trust that it does, it will. If you trust that this, that you've envisioned, or something better is making its way toward you, it inevitably has to. Or to quote that wonderful Hafiz line that I revisit constantly, that ever since it heard your name, ever since it heard your name, joy has been running through the streets trying to find you. I just love that. And I picture like the old quarter of, a, of an, an Arab town, you know, a North African town, right? The old quarter with the winding streets to the bazaar and stuff. And I picture Joy running, looking around the corner. And it's, where, where is he? You know, try, trying to, because it, it heard my name and it heard your name. And it's running through the streets trying to find you. If it's running through the streets trying to find you, you know what you need to do about that? Stop. Okay? Stand still. Let it catch you. Otherwise, it chases you. And that brings us to a whole other subject around this, which is that a lot of times we try to outrun our good because if our good really showed up, like if it's about a partner or something, if they showed up in our life, God, then we'd have to deal with them. Right? Or we get the wonderful new new job. I talked about this, I think, last week, too. You get the wonderful new job, the great promotion and all of this. Now you've got stuff you have to learn you didn't know. Now you look a little foolish for a while because before it was all just like, you know, walk in the park. And now, and now there's this. Or you go out for the play, okay? You go out for a role and you get it. Great. Good for you. Now you got to learn your lines. Now you got to show up. Now you got to deliver. So there's a part of us that works in um, not exactly opposition, but sometimes counterproductively to this, our fear. And when you, okay, run through the streets and joy is chasing you through the streets and you stop and you let joy catch up with you, remember to stop as you're running away from your goals and stop and turn and look them in the face and say, I got this. I can do this. My heart wants to do this and whatever I need to learn and whatever I need to release, whatever I need to release from my life in order to be able to accomplish this thing, I'm up for that. I'm up for that. Always turn, you know, Ernest Holmes famously said turn away from the condition, but he meant in the realization step in treatment, in prayer. That's where we, we don't sit there and dwell on the condition in prayer because then that's the impulse that we're giving in the spirit spiritual law. But the rest of the time in the run-up to prayer, the stuff that worries you, that you're afraid of and all like this, turn around and look it right in the face. And you know what it'll do? It'll kind of melt away. It'll melt away. She also said, prayer affirms what eternally exists. Prayer then is not trying to manufacture something that has not existed before. Another way of putting that is that all of us who practice the science of mind teaching must realize that everyone on earth has always practiced the science of mind teaching. As long as there have been sentient beings on this planet, they have been practicing the science of mind. They just didn't know it by that name. In some cases, they didn't know it at all. Just like I didn't know it at all until I did, and you didn't know it at all until you did, right? Maybe you knew it from the crib, but most people don't. 
somebody tells you that you have a connection between thoughts and things, between cause and effect, and you're like, really? And then you start to uh, experiment with that. And you, and you see how that works, and you string the experiments together, and pretty soon you've got a, you've got a nascent belief system going on there. You know. But everybody's doing this thing, so this is not, we're not, um, we don't have to activate spiritual law, we don't have to start the process, it's not reinventing the wheel, all of this kind of thing, because it's already happened. Spiritual law is taking the direct impress of our thought, wrapped in feeling and doing something with it, manifesting from it. That's not the issue, never been the issue. The issue, if there is an issue, is the quality of the thought and the intensity of the feeling that we're putting together that we're then handing off to spiritual law. So that's where we want to look, okay? Am I really excited about what I want to create in my life or am I trying to satisfy somebody else's expectations of me and so on? Or am I trying to outrun my own past or fulfill my own expectations that expired 10 years ago on the shelf or, you know, there are a lot of different uh, possibilities there. And one of those possibilities that really works, which is to take full possession of our faculties right now and say, very well, now, doesn't matter what came before this moment I am using spiritual law as Ernest Holmes put it I'm using spiritual law along specific lines toward a particular purpose is that great I'm using spiritual law along particular lines to a specific purpose and I'm going to do this regularly and it's going to be my spiritual practice along with reading and meditation and yoga and whatever else I'm into. This is going to be a central part of my spiritual practice, to revisit this and introduce it into what has been called the subconscious mind, the subconscious aspect of mind, or as I'm increasingly thinking of it, as our operating system, our personal operating system. Okay. That has, again, been there all along and just needs the introduction of some new information from time to time, including prayer for life, health, wholeness, and harmony. That's a nice list. She made that list, Reverend Sally Taylor did. These four things, life, health, wholeness, and harmony. Somebody might say, where's cash money in that? Well, wholeness, you know, comes under that heading. Where's power and authority? And so, well, you know, harmony, you don't really need power. You know, people, I think, I go along with this meme that says people who seek power are the last people who should have it. <laughs> you know, it's Jesus at the temple, age, what, 12? And the authorities, the elders said he speaks as one with authority. That's power. That's power. What was the authority from? He wasn't telling other people what to do. He wasn't pushing other people around. He was speaking about his connection with the source of his own being. The deity of his understanding, which, by the way, he called Abba, or Father. Papa, really, Papa. Not so much formal father as Papa. That's how he, that's how he thought of the deity. You could do worse. I mean, he, yeah, it's gendered and all, but it it's, seems kind of friendly. Seems kind of, you know, seems kind of, I don't know, warm. And he speaks as one with authority. And the old people, they were all astonished. Who is this kid? How does he know these things? You know why he knew these things? Because he wasn't listening to them. He wasn't listening to their watered-down story of how things were. He was going directly to the source of his own being and communing with that. And that's the key here, is to understand in relation with the deity, in this teaching, we have a direct, unmediated connection. Direct, unmediated. You know what unmediated means, right? It means nobody's a gatekeeper there between you and there's no um, concierge or something in the process. There's no executive assistant or something in the process. There's no hierarchy of angels or archangels interfering with the process. I love the idea of angels and archangels. It's great. The more the, the, more the merrier is how I look at it, you know, and that sounds super. But they're, they're not there to 
to run transit back and forth between me and the deity. That's, uh-uh, it's direct. It is direct. I remember one time I was driving on a street near here, and you know how these, these churches have a, a message board out front. And uh, I saw this one, and it said, God has no grandchildren. God has, and I'm about a block or two away from that, and I'm thinking, that's kind of sad, you know, because I enjoyed being a grandchild. My grandmother was, you know, blah, I go into this whole thing like it's about me. I say, like, wait a minute, wait a minute. What it's saying is there's no secondary generation in relationship to the deity. Everybody is its, if you're going to use a family model, everybody is its child not its stepchild, grandchild, nephew, niece. You know, everybody is a direct expression of this, of this one, of this one. And from that we take our authority. And again, it's not the authority to push other people around or the authority to outline, which we are, I'll talk more about that next week, but um, outlining in prayer means basically, like I said, evicting somebody from the house you want to live in or out of the job you want to have or you know it's got to be this and nothing else nothing else will satisfy it's very limiting and it kind of defeats the purpose not only will we not manifest effectively doing that but it puts us back in the mindset that the deity is not all there is that the universe is not one whole system but rather it's this fragmented thing you know that has to be persuaded and, and negotiated with and all the rest of that okay just a little bit more for you, because I'm running out of voice, folks, i got to tell you. <clears throat> Prayer is not a position, but a disposition. Oh, gosh, I love that. Prayer is not a position, but... See, the position, again, is the argument. Well, God, you know, if it be thy will, I realize I'm not worthy, but okay, that's a position. It's an humble position. It's kind of a sad position, sort of a beaten-down position. Reverend Sally says... Prayer is a disposition. What is a disposition? What do we talk about each other's? It's an old-fashioned word, really, anymore, but we'll say, well, someone's in a bad disposition. It means mood. It means attitude. Your disp Prayer is an attitude. Prayer is an attitude of acceptance, of affirmation. And I was telling the group yesterday, I said there are some teachers who have said, don't pray, by which they meant, because when you pray, you're limiting the limitless. Instead, place yourself in a mindset of limitless unfolding good and be willing to be surprised. Now, that's a high game right there. That really is. I, I, uh, I suggest, you know, some of that prayer as needed and you know it's uh that's taking the training wheels off really to get to that place where you know um but always prayer for the suffering always prayer for the suffering with direct intention and the more we feed our own intention about the good of others the general good of others without manipulation without coercion the more that we accept our own. I'm going to close with this thought, uh, you know, where it's not about will, uh, it's, about, it's about willingness. It's about willingness, not about willpower, but about willingness. And a quick and wonderful exercise that you can undertake if you haven't been doing it already is to imagine the good that you wish to manifest in your life in some particular area and then affirm and know and imagine that every person you know has a similar quality of good in their life, including the people you don't like, including the people you don't understand, including the people you read about in the news who make your hair stand on end, okay? Imagine this for everyone without critique, without withhold. Imagine it for everyone. And what you're doing may or may not affect them because that's going to involve their choice field. But what you're doing is affirming at the deepest possible level oneness, oneness.
for to the degree that we would withhold any good from any other living being, we necessarily, by law, deny it to ourselves. And you know why? Because spiritual law doesn't know the difference between you and them. Reverend Lisa gave a wonderful talk on this about three years ago in the height of the pandemic. There is no us or them. Or I think it was there is no them. There is an us, but there's no them. There has to be somebody, right? So we'll call it an us. Somebody's here, so it's an us, but there is no them. So we affirm to ourselves that it's all one. It's all one, and I stand in the midst of that oneness, and I manifest the good that I desire, which is primarily peace of mind primarily contentment, primarily strength. Let's know together now, one power, one presence, one spirit, everywhere manifesting. And I am so grateful for the Reverend Sally Taylor and for all the other teachers that we are exploring and will explore through this series, the great wisdom that they brought us. And I'm grateful for this time together, all of us here, knowing what we know, doing what we do, and choosing to be agents of healing in the world, agents of healing for ourselves and for this planet and for those who call upon us. Scripture talks about call upon the name of the Lord. And as spiritual teachers, we are those who are called upon to keep the high watch, to know the highest and best, for anyone suffering or lost or confused, or even sort of generally dissatisfied, who doesn't know why, but just is. There is a great destiny awaiting each of us. It's unfolding around us right now. Everything that's happened up to this point has been a piece of it. Now it's all coming together and making sense and forming patterns. There's great work for us to do. We shall rise up and do mighty things. For this knowing, for this beautiful spiritual community, for this commitment that we have to do the deep work follow where it leads. I am so deeply grateful. I release this word now into spirit, into the one, I'm calling it done. And so it is. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for being here yet again. We love you and appreciate your energy. We appreciate your presence. We appreciate everything that you give to this center, including your monetary donations. Nations. Thank you for entrusting us with your gift. Because you entrust us, we're able to be here with you and for you. So thank you so much. And I invite you now to say with me. Oh, as our ushers make their way to the back. I forgot my line. I'm sorry. As our ushers make their way to the back, I invite you to say with me. Divine love, through me, bless us and multiplies all the good I am and have all the good I give and receive. I am prosperous now, and so it is. Did mention 15 feet of snow, right? I'm not exaggerating. In some places, they did get a whole lot of snow. Uh, I've, one of the reverends that I know was about to move from West Coast to East Coast, and they're doing it via pod, and they had so much snow that the pod couldn't get to them. So it's like, all right. Mother Nature, dial it back a little bit. <laughs> dial it back a little bit. So for all of those people in the areas where the snow is kind of getting in their way, let's have a knowing for them that the weather eases up a little bit. And for those of us, don't bring us the heat back. Not yet, not yet, not yet. <laughs> we know it's coming. All right, know with me that there is one presence, one power, one life, one love. And each and every one of us live that life. We are that presence. We channel that love. 
And that power enters this material realm through us and does amazing things. Does amazing things. So as Ram Dass says, we're just walking each other home. So let's reach out our hands, both physically and metaphysically, to each other. Look in each other's eyes and say, I see you. I see the beloved child of God in you. I know your heart is full of love and that you are held in the arms of comfort. I see you. I hear you. I know you as the beloved child of God that you are. What more can we ask for? To be seen, to be known, to be loved, to be heard. I see you. And I'm grateful to know this. I am grateful to know that I am a beloved child of God. I am grateful to know that each and every one of you are a beloved child of God. I am grateful for a teaching that teaches me how to find out who I am. I am grateful for this community. I am grateful for our musicians. I am grateful for our ministers. I am grateful for our practitioners. I am grateful for each and every one of you. And I relax into this knowing. Release it and know that it is so and so it is. I use it. And I love it. And I love it. So it is. And so it is.